hello and welcome to well it's the m15 class and it's i think part seven although to be fair i do lose count sometimes of which exact part it is on the monitors because i have been delaying these a bit because i'm trying to arrange to spend the day and i think i have now got it all sorted out in portsmouth looking at m33 for what will be the next part in this series so Thankfully, when I search fire support, I it goes as high as part six, so I'm fairly sure this is part seven. And before I get into it, and before I start talking about it, I'm going to start off by what is going to become my normal mentioning thing, because that's the only way I stand a chance of doing this. So, I have a lovely new Spreadshirt store active with, these are some of the designs, there are more coming when Spreadshirt eventually lets them through. Uh, the, the, uh, the basic ones get through quite quickly, the picture ones seem to take forever, which you can understand, copyright laws and all that stuff. Anyway, so these are up there. And when I was talking about this with my family, my aunt made a bet. The bet was, and it's for family bragging rights, that if I have doubled, and I've currently got roughly 6,440-odd subscribers, so if I double that, and we settled on, she decided that 13,000, we decided 13,000 was the figure, we'll go for the doubling. Rounds it up makes it a little bit harder for me, but it's easier to sort of monitor than having exact down to the minute numbers, she and my uncle will be pictured wearing Blackburn Blackburn face masks. And I will display that picture on the 2nd of January in the brewships, because it has to be by the 31st of December. On or by, on the 31st of December, I think it has to reach 13,000 subscribers. So I have a little over four months. And that's where you will come in. So thank you for watching. I hope you like. I hope you subscribe. I hope you share. And I know there are several of you out there who go, oh, are going to go, but we don't like having the admin section up front. It's for family bragging rights. I'm doing the admin section. It will be over now. But please, please subscribe, share, like, share it on social media everything that you're very very kind and if you do like any of the designs or want to see any more coming um spreadshirt link is down below as is discord patron joining this channel if you prefer to join the youtube channel rather than do patron all of them are down there thank you very much right so the m15 class and what can i say about the m15 class well, let's start off with this. Every time I bring up monitor, and I say I start talking about a monitor, you either get people expecting me to be talking about a martial nay class or something similar that looks like this with huge battleship level guns, or they expect the USS monitor. That seems to be the two groups that they come into, the two groups that these numbers fall into. And you couldn't actually be more wrong, because, well, that's a feature of the American Civil War. There aren't many around the world elsewhere, and even the ones which are in America very quickly... Well, there's a few that look like that, <laughs> but very quickly, the ones which stay around, especially post the Civil War, don't look like that. And this is the big beauty. This is the creme de la creme of monitors. The vast majority are not the creme de la creme. This is, again, something which you have to sort of explain naval warfare a lot. Yes, history books tend to focus on the battleships on the aircraft carriers, on the glorious ships, the big ships, the prestige assets. Because they tend to be major parts of the big glorious battles. 
or inglorious battles, depending on what they are. And that's fine. That's history. That's what you're writing. But the reality is that those vessels are never produced in enough numbers to be the vast majority of your ships. And actually, you can argue that with the growth and expense of combat systems that we are now facing today, that we are at a moment where we don't know what the cheap ship's going to be. We don't know what the quickly produced vessel is going to be. We do not know what it is. There are possibly options with uncrewed vessels. But the trouble is, does that mean that's going to produce a huge burden on satellite communications? Well, can't, do we A, have the satellites for that in the first place, and B, won't that mean that satellite communications then become the Achilles heel? They already are the Achilles heel, that you can argue, of modern forces, but they could be taken out. There are all sorts of issues in terms of modern, smaller ships. Which also, again, tends to lead the focus back onto the role of the big ships and what happened. Which is why you can get the wrong impression. This is what most of the Royal Navy monitors look like, and I know I've talked about a couple of monitors like this before already. And we have mentioned the Gorgon class. But these are really classic Royal Navy First World War monitors. The M15 class. This, if I'm not mistaken, is M17. But I will just quickly check that one. Because I have exactly three... Yes, it is M17. She was armed with... A 9.2 inch Mark 10 gun, uh, which had come probably from a Drake class cruiser. And she's equipped with triple expansion steam engines, which we're talking about. But she is a classic example of what a monitor actually looks like, of what a monitor actually is. One really massive gun on the front. Another not too shabby gun on the rear astern, and in her case, usually, um, well, she usually had a 12 pounder, that's a 76 millimeter or three inch gun on the back, and also carried a six pounder or a 57 millimeter AA quick firing Mark I AA gun. But get into all this. This is what the monitors look like. They are shallow draft. She serves in the Mediterranean from August 1915 to October 1918, and in the Baltic from March to September 1919. She's part of the War Emergency Program. She is the Royal Navy reacting. One of the interesting joys I have in history, and I would also point this out to anyone, is that a number of people tell me that the Royal Navy and Britain started its war procurement too late in World War II, that they waited too long for bringing in emergency procurements in 1938-1939, etc. And I can see the case. There is a strong case to be made that they should have gone into full war emergency procurement after the Munich crisis. They should have done a sort of massive naval rearm program based on that point. Or, and there's even a, there's a strong argument, as I've said in other videos, that the Royal Navy should have been building sloops as they could get away with them. There was no limit on their numbers. Um, in numbers that match their destroyer build every year from about 1928 onwards. And I feel you could have justified all these. But the governments were worried about it precipitating a war. Uh, my point would have been if the Royal Navy's building sloops, <laughs> if anyone is actually scared of the Royal Navy growing its sloop force, um, then more than likely they've got a reason to be scared. Sloops are only really useful in defensive roles in a war. They are 
escorts for convoys, minesweepers, small ships. They are no threat to pretty much anything else which isn't a submarine. Or, another, or maybe a, a surface raider if they're very lucky and the surface raider is having a bad day. Or they're coming in a pack. And I'm not talking about a Graf Space surface raider, I'm talking about an armed merchant cruiser surface raider. Uh, that's the sloop problem. The other thing, the thing that the Royal Navy doesn't build enough of, I would argue, in World War II, and that it does, it is monitors. Although they do go to some very interesting types of landing craft, which you could argue fulfill that role. But the one, getting back to the point I was making, they start building so late because they have a colossal emergency build program in World War One, and they get things like an entire class of 14 monitors built within a year. And yes, about three of them have triple expansion prov uh, engines providing 800 horsepower to two shafts. Uh, um, M18 has Bollander four-cylinder semi-diesel providing 640 horsepower to four shafts. Now, here's the interesting thing. 19 to 28 theoretically have Campbell four-cylinder paraffin engines providing 560 brake horsepower to four engines, issue four shafts. But there is a debate about that, and honestly, I would call those, figure, those numbers guides rather than definite. I would do some research, because I, I have been doing my best, and... Honestly, you are limited. Pretty much Randall Gray's um, 1985 book has been all I've found, which is halfway decent when it comes to this class. And when I get a chance, again, I'm uh, my book list of books are probably not popular topics, but are books I'm intending to do. Start off with, of course, Sloops. I'm going to be doing a naval aviation book based on my PhD at some point. I want to do a book about Admiral Henderson, for obvious reasons. I think I'm going to have to do a book on monitors as well. Because I don't think anyone else is going to. And I'm tempted to do a book on aircraft engines, literally from the point of view of naval aircraft engines, and why it matters. Why the density of power generation matters in aircraft, and also in small boats. But... I really am thinking that on my book list, I'm of book list of books I'm going to have to get around to writing at some point and do the research on is monitors because this class is so critical and there is such a sparsity of information about them. The other good book, of course, and you will know because I have mentioned this before, is this one. This, of course is Sir Reginald Bacon's The Concise Story of the Dover Patrol. Now, this is a very cool book, and I'll be getting into this at another point, and I've got into this in other videos. But again, this is published in... nineteen thirty. Two, well, printed in 1932. Might well have been published slightly earlier, considering it has a foreword from Admiral the Fleet Lord Jellicoe. That's a, that's a long time ago. That's bang on nearly 90 years. Anyway, 14 of these ships were completed, 4 were lost, including one to submarine laid mines and one to a submarine torpedo fired by a coastal submarine torpedo a coastal mine lay, a, 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 a coastal mine laying submarine what can i say there's a whole literal war going on in world war 1 that we hardly ever hear about that's absolutely vicious at one point you even have some of the monitors and this is some reports i read some of them might have equipped themselves with depth charges because they were they were seeing submarines below them 
because they were operating in the shallow waters. Uh, displacement 50, 540 tons, length 177 feet or 54 meters. That's an interesting statistic. Beam 31 feet. Draft 6 foot 9 inches or 2.6 meters. Which might sound quite large to you, but I know now not today, but when I was younger and most swimming pools had a deep end which was two and a half or more meters deep, that thing could have gone and floated at them. Okay, if they'd been made a little bit wider and a little bit longer. <laughs> but the point stands, okay? That, you know, water which you and I, which many people here probably would not be that worried about being in depth wise, these ships wouldn't worry about being in depth wise. And that was the point. They were steerable, they were shallow draft, and they could bring in usually a 9.2 inch gun, but they got adapted as time went on. Some of them had changed their guns around, some of them gave their gun, guns to the army and got another gun instead, some of them got different guns added on. And, all sorts of modifications took place because, again, when you're dealing with the smaller ships of war, how do I put this? If you announced to the an admiral that you had swapped out HMS Warspite's guns for, I don't know, 16 inch ones because you fancied them, they would probably be slightly worried about you and there'd be a lot of Department of Naval Constructors coming after you, um, going, What have you done to our ship? If you are in a small ship, I don't know, a destroyer, corvette, sloop, monitor, especially the smaller monitors, where admirals rarely tread and even captains are a rarity to see. It's usually a lieutenant commander or junior who ends up in charge. Well... Those are usually pragmatic reservist officers who have pragmatic reservist chief NCOs. And they are pragmatic about the fact that they are going into conflict and they're in a small ship. <laughs> so the question becomes more a case of what can we fit here? And does it go bang? So theoretically, a 9.2 inch Mark 10 gun, mostly from Drake class and Cressy class cruisers. Mostly, he says. Uh, occasionally interesting. And, however, it was only the first 10 ships which received the Mark 10 gun. No, the first four ships would receive the Mark 10 gun. So that's M15 to 18. The rest received the Mark 6 gun. Well, there's a debate. Is it the Mark 10 or the Mark 6 mounting turrets? Some of them received them directly from the cruisers. Some of them were highly adapted. And it's a fun time. Again, some of them were even more adapted once their crews got hold of them. A 12-pounder, as we talked about, and a 6-pounder. Now, a 12-pounder is an interesting weapon. I like the 12-pounder. But it's a 3-inch gun. And you will notice that 3-inch guns keep coming around because... A 3-inch gun is about the biggest anyone can sustain what you would call truly rapid fire from. And this is even, with, and I know the pace of fire does go up as time goes on. And so people will go, well, that's not truly rapid fire because compared to today, that's nothing. No, traffic, truly rapid fire for the metallurgy of technological, uh, metallurgy and technological availability of the day. A three inch is about the biggest you can sustain truly rapid fire from. We're not talking 10 round, 10, 12 rounds a minute from a 6-inch gun. We're talking 2 to 3 times that sometimes. And they can really pound out the fire path. 
And it's also got a uh, six pounder, 57 millimeter gun. Ray A work. So you have a general purpose 12 pounder, which theoretically was supposed to be anti surface, but um, the mounts often got modified so they could fire a little higher. Uh, not that massively high, but high for the time. And a six pounder, 57 millimeter. If anyone's thinking and looking around at currently what the most popular quoted and looked at closing weapon systems are that we're currently looking at now, we're thinking we might really have to actually deal with an air to a, 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 a um, peer on peer potential conflict or deter one. You will notice that the three inch and the 57 millimeter are proving incredibly popular again. I'm not saying history is cycl uh, cyclical, but um, yeah. So, the clock. Apparently one of the slides has disappeared. Give me a second. Working now. So, we have M15, which was launched on 28th of April 1915 and sunk by UC-38 on the 11th of November 1917. A year today before the war ended. M16. Got there before the uh, the rifle did, so has prior claim on it. Launched on the 3rd of May, 1915. Sold on 29th of January, 1920. So made it through the war. Very good service. In fact... M16 spent most of the war in the Mediterranean, serving there from July 1915 to October 1918. She and She, like all her sisters, was ordered in March 1915. So they are ordered in March 1915, launched May 1915, uh, launched May 1915, and pretty much in service within a few weeks. At, you know, service a few weeks later, in June 1915. That is not unusual for this class. In fact, M16, when she sold in 1920. It goes on for mercantile service as an oil tanker with the Anglo-Saxon Petroleum Company and is renamed Higa. What an inappropriate name for that little ship. Nowhere near was a Tiga. M17, which was of course pictured earlier, as you know, has an eventful career and is launched on 12th of May 1915, sold on 12th of May 1920. Rather appropriate. And she sold to Intermercantile Service as an oil tanker as well, renamed Tojo. That's T O D E J O E, J O E, if anyone's asking. M eighteen M eighteen is well, she serves in Mediterranean. Again. Baltic, April to June 1919, so she's even serving still after World War One is over. And it's, of course, the vessel which is fitted with a four-shaft uh, um, four Bollander Tucson, the semi-diesel engine, with 640 horsepower. And before I ask the question, a semi-diesel engine is, well, otherwise known as a hothead engine, and it's not really a true diesel. It's retain some of the functions of diesel with exception of the high compression rate and it does this because the head or bulb in the combustion chamber is heated to near red heat usually with a kerosene torch the engine therefore usually has a manual pump that will force an amount of fuel that we sprayed for a nozzle into the combustion chamber against the heated area as the engine is rolled against compression the manual pump is activated and spray fuel lights this in turn creates pressure in the combustion chamber against a, pin a piston for starting the engine. And once the engine has started, fuel addition under pressure continues automatically and is controlled by a governor. So there is similar details. But in a semi diesel, once the engine starts, the heat source for the hot head or bulb can be removed. The heat is generated by the combustion itself to continue the ignition process. And typically, semi-diesel engines have a 5 to 1 to 7 to 1 compression ratio and can use a variety of liquid heavy fuels, 
kerosene, heavy bunker oil, almost anything in between. They are very, very useful in wartime. However, they're also finicky as anything to maintain and keep going, and don't really like salt water. There again, no engine really likes salt water that much, so can you blame them that much? No. M19. Sheets 1 and 1's completed in Govan. And on the f she serves in the Mediterranean from July 1915 to December 1915. But unfortunately, in December 1915, she's badly damaged by a gun, a gun explosion. She doesn't return to home waters and pays off Mudros in 1919, uh, where she is sold to mercantile service and becomes an oil tanker named Delapan. Oh, and I think I, may have, sorry, I forgot to mention, M18 is also sold in 1920 for mercantile service as an oil tanker renamed Anam. Noticing a theme, I'm guessing where these strips are being sold to. Though, honestly, there isn't mu there aren't much details, and I'm not 100% sure. M20, well, she's completed by July 1915 in service by then. And she again doesn't return to home waters, pays off at Malta after having served the entire war in the Mediterranean and is sold to become an oil tanker and renamed Lima, and M21. Well, she's uh, getting, you might notice that a lot of these are heading out to Mediterranean in September, from the September 1915. They're heading out to support Dardanelles and other operations out there. In September 1917, M21 actually had her main gun removed. It was required for artillery use on the Western Front. And it's substituted by a seven and a half inch gun, which is fitted on the loo. This, of course, is the vessel fitted. I think, though, at the time in the picture, she is displaying her original gun. She serves at the Dover Patrol from October 1917 after this. However, she struck a mine off Ostend on the 20th of October 1918, most likely a submarine laid mine, and is taken in tow to Dover but sinks off West Pier. They're a cool little class. They're war emergency ships, and they work really well. So, next ones in the list, and because there are seven on each slide, we have M22, which, according to Wikipedia, also has a triple expansion engine, but according to other books, including ones which are incredibly vague on the topic, it might not. So I've said, probably. It's part, it doesn't, because the others were all all sort of upgraded at this sort of time. But it might have done. And as built, it has a 9.2 inch gun, Mark 6 mounting, a 12 pounder, and a 6 pounder. In 1918, it has a 9.2 inch gun. Uh, quick firing 3 inch AA gun has replaced, well, in a sort of dual purpose mount, has replaced the 76 millimeter dual purpose gun. It's, a, it's amazing. 12 pounder 3 inch was replaced by another 3 inch. Just anyone would think. And it still retained a 6 pounder. She's also built at Govan. She serves the Mediterranean from September 1915 to December 1918. She then serves in the Black Sea from June to September 1919 and is towed home and converted to a mine layer in 1920. Renamed HMS Medea. In December 1925, and she becomes a training ship in January 1937. She is sold in December 1938, wrecked in the second on the second of January 1939. I'm not sure how much of her existing weapons, etc., and systems remained, but you have to think if Britain had realised that war was coming quite soon, so soon, this vessel would have been still been serviceable, you know. M22 would have been still been viable. As probably not frontline effort, or maybe you're not even in the monitor role, but as something which was stealing the nets and managing those, could have worked. Right. M23, as you can see, launched on the 17th of June, 1915, renamed Cleverhouse, uh, Cleverhouse in 1922, 
Serves till 1959 as the RNVR drill ship in Sheerness. She, as of course, started her war with a 9.2 inch gun, a 12 pounder, and a 6 pounder. That's what we know of. She finishes in 1918 with a 7.5 inch gun and a 50, uh, 7 .5, 50, uh, 50, cal uh, 50 caliber gun, a uh, 3 inch AA gun, a 12, still retains a 12 pounder. So she actually has two 76 mil uh, 75 millimeters, 3 inch guns, really, and um, has managed to get. Two quick firing two pounders, so she has two 40 millimeters. So she's changed her 57 millimeter for a double 40 millimeter bit. She serves in the Mediterranean main uh, from October 1915. She returns from Mediterranean in May 1917. She loses her gun to the Western Front, and then she serves a Dover patrol till 19 June 1918. She also sees service with the North Russian Expeditionary Force. And prior to her departure, she had the two pounder guns and the two pounder and the twelve pounder, the two two pounders and twelve pounders, all replaced by more AA guns. But none of my sources seem to list which ones. And it's only in 1919 that she refers or returns to Sheerness, November 1919, a year after World War One is officially over. She's then moved to Dundee, where she becomes a Ronnie volunteered reserve drill ship, and she operates between there and Sheerness for quite a while. I put Sheerness there because that's where she was converted, and sometimes she's considered base, but Dundee is where she spends most of her time, actually, I think. Sorry. Notes to... Uh... Blue, uh, to um, slide mishap. She is serves in this capacity until 1959, and she then arrives at Charleston, Fife, in April 1959. Is broken up then. M24. Well, a fun little ship. Her gun, her Mark VI gun, actually we know where it comes from. It comes from the Edgar class cruiser HMS Endyman. And due to a short of engines, she's equipped with a four cylinder paraffin engines from the Campbell Gas Company. So she is M24, is, we are certain, is one of the first gas powered ships in the Royal Navy. One of the first. I'm not saying the first, but one of the first. The first is a bit of a hotly debated topic. There are lots of official pronouncements, but then you look at the smaller ships and there are some very interesting small boats which have very interesting engines and technically... Anyway. She says Dover Patrol for most of her career. Um, October 1915 to June 1918. And she loses her 9.2 inch gun in 1916 and how for the West again to going to the Western Front because they need more heavy guns and has a 7.5 inch gun fitted in lieu. She also goes to serve with a Northern a Russian Expeditionary Force. And prior to departure, she again has her guns replaced with AA guns. Now, here is the interesting thing. For her, I managed to find some notes about what they might be. This might mean all the class were fitted with them, but we can't be sure. Which suggests that all of them are fitted with the latest version of two pounders. In that they've had the Mark II, and there's a newer version come out, uh, what will eventually lead to the pom bomb. Anyway, she's sold in January 1920 and is converted to a mercantile oil canter, tanker. Renamed Sato. Twenty-five. Um, well, twenty-five starts off, of course, life of a nine-point-two-inch gun. Does her service with the Dover Patrol. When she loses it, she gains a seven-and-a-half-inch gun. We know from HMS Twister. Mm -hmm. She, um, along with twenty-three, twenty-seven, thirty-one, thirty-three, and Humber. Uh, were the vessels sent, of course, to Murmansk for the help of the Northern Russian Expeditionary Force in May 1919. 
In June 1919, M25 moved Archangel, travelling up the Davina River to cover the withdrawal of British and White Russian forces. Her and her sister, the M27, were unable to be recovered though when the river level fell, and so were scuttled in 16 September 1919 after running aground in order to stop them being captured by the Red Russians. Yes, they were worried about losing them to the Red Russians, because they might actually improve the quality of their navy. Life happens. Now, let's go to M26. M26 goes through much the same story as the rest. She serves her life on the Dover Patrol, she has a gun changed, she gets a 7.5, ends her career with 7.5. Um, she also ends her career with two free inch guns, although one's technically called a 12 pounder. One's technically 76.2 millimeters, and one's technically 76 millimeters, but let's be honest, they're both pretty much free inches. And she sold in 1920 for, guess what? Conversion to a tanker named Doa. D O E W A. 27, as we've heard how her life ends, uh, she's covering, uh, she of course, like 25, is scuttled to prevent being captured by the uh, Russians. However, her gun, her 9.2 inch gun, is replaced, and she gets a 6 inch Mark II gun, probably, from HMS Redoubtable one of um, uh, the Royal Sovereign class, pre dreadnought battleships, and that is later replaced by a 6-inch Mark VII gun, which possibly comes from a cruiser, but no one's quite sure which one. So she has a 6-inch gun when she's out there, and her armament, this is the joy that's sort of when you start going through it. Okay, because her armament is also listed, but I can't use that for the others because her arm has changed quite so much. She starts as built with a 9.2 inch and a 12 pounder, 6 pounder. By 1918, she has a 6 inch, a 3 inch, and a 12 pounder, and two 2 pounders. By 1919, when she's recovering the Russians, she has a 4 inch triple Mark IX gun, which I'm thinking came from the renowned class battle cruisers, was a spare from them, because I can't see one being purposefully ordered for a monitor, so I'm reckoning there was a spare left over from their construction. She is has two quick firing three inch AA guns and two quick firing two pounders. But that's quite a different weapons fit than everyone else has. And finally, M28. Now here is the one that's, that's going to be someone very interested in, because she spends most of her service attached to the Aegean Squadron and with the coastal bombardment of Turkish position, uh, positions there. She bombards the Bulgarian port of De Dedak in 21st of October 1915. She, on 25th of January 1918, she's at Kuzu Bay off the island of Imbros, and you can guess what I'm going to say. She's with Raglan, she's with Lizard, and Tigris. And they're attacked by the former Goban and Breslau. They, those vessels managed to trap M28 and Raglan in the bay, and as a result, M28 is sunk. Because let's be honest, a ship which has a 9.2-inch gun, a 12-pounder, and a 6-pounder, is not going to stand up any chance against the Goban and the Breslau. There's just no chance. Now, I'm hoping, for all our sakes, that I remember to mention that... Uh, M15 was sunk by UC38, a UC2 class submarine. If I didn't, I'm sorry. That's the fate of M15. Anyway, 
most of our understanding of what these ships do, and some one of our best sources, is also one of our most, I wouldn't say biased, because it's not. It's it's a very exacting work. It's a very thorough work. But you also have to remember that Bacon is a strong personality who absolutely believed it was hogwash that submarines were making it through the Dover Barrage at, and then the, the great big sort of thing across Dover, the minefield and barrage at night. And it's only after Jellicoe's left office and Lord Weymouth, or the guy who succeeds Jellicoe, orders him to turn the lights on that the very night the lights are turned on, they catch a submarine trying to get through the barrage in the night. And so from that moment on, the lights are left on, but Bacon, uh, Bacon's fired. And replaced with Churchill's favourite admiral, Keyes. When the primary role, though, of the Dover Patrol was monitors blowing things up, you couldn't have asked for a better officer. Bacon is a very experienced gunnery officer, a very a very knowledgeable officer, and there is a reason, not always a good one, but there is a reason, he was chosen as the first captain of HMS Dreadnought. And there's also a reason he ends up going and running Coventry Ordnance Works and all sorts of things. He has a tremendous technical ability. And he is very exacting. But one of the interesting things is he really pushes for this class of monitors. You would expect a man who is obsessed with gunnery in an era where we are supposed to be talking about battleship admirals would be obsessed with pushing for the martial knaves and the other big, uh, big, battle, uh, big battleship gun level sort of monitors. But no, he is really keen on the smaller guns. The reason is because, in the nicest way, a 9.2 inch gun is still bigger than a lot of field artillery and more than most positions can deal with. It has a far more rapid fire. And if you are dealing with a smaller ship which can get closer to its target and it's a single gun, having the rapid fire allows you to correct and aim far more quickly. So. Very good account in this book. I think I've read from it before, so I'm not going to do that again. But it's one of the things I admit when looking through this and reading through these books from this period. There is a level of candor often in them which you wouldn't get today. And that's something important. This is why I do not accuse him of bias. I do accuse him of being very thorough and vitriolic when it comes to BT. He really doesn't like BT. I can agree, I can understand that, but that colours his judgement somewhat. But he is interested in being right. More often than he is interested in grinding his axe into his opponents. Right. Now, what's the legacy of these smaller ships? And it's something I'll be talking to, but I'm hoping as we get further on in these, and especially as I get to the next part, there's going to be a slightly different background when I'm talking about this. Well, there's a legacy of the small mods. For starters, there is some very, very cool models out there. Some really cool models to build. Mostly, though, it's this. The Atanza tank boat. Indonesia's answer to its coastline issues. Because this vessel, and it's very cute, if we consider its stats, is 43 tons. It's roughly 18.75 metres overall length. And it's... Seven and a half meters wide, a draft of 0.9 meters. It's shallow draft. It's as fast as they can make it. It can. It's got a smaller crew as it can make it. It's as cheap to build as possible. 
it can be armed with a 30mm cannon, critically it can be armed with bigger weapons, but they haven't yet decided to fit them. And even Russia is considering ordering some. The United Arab Emirates have signed a MOU with Indonesia. A memorandum of understanding, that is. India, Greece, the Philippines all express interest because the issue hasn't gone away. That inshore fire support from the sea can be very, very useful in certain circumstances. They can recognize this, especially after the experience of the Dover Patrol on the hood, which had helped fight off the German assaults on the Belgian positions and the British positions on the coast. These ships were useful. They could get in close. And they could cause a lot of damage. They could help manoeuvre uh, personnel. They could help cover personnel. Because they could get in close. Two metres of water sounds deep. As I said, it's a deep part of it. It's a deep end of a swimming pool. But that's quite close in shore. That's close enough that if you're going into wooden rowing boats, you could actually make it to shore fairly quickly. And that matters. And you're doing that patrol with a fairly heavy capability firing support for you. Again, that matters. The more things change, the more things stay the same is an often quoted thing. It's a, a phrase, an aphorism, which has lasted for many, many years. But not necessarily wrong. When we're talking about ships these days, we're incredibly focused on the high-tech big solutions, because we have to be. Because they are critical. Because they matter. Because they're very expensive and take a long time to build. But the thing is, we don't have the capacity anymore to do the rapid building of the small things. That has always been the excuse. Always been the reason. We don't need to build the small ships because if a major conflict comes up, we have time to build them. We can go and convert X yard to building them all. Y yard. Well, do X or Y yard have the capacity to really do rapid building? If you're talking about small vessels like this, you'll be looking at yachts, yacht shipyards, and trawler shipyards, and... If you're in Britain, maybe the lifeboat shipyards. All down in pool. They're lovely. But none of them are really built around the concept of a high rate of construction. Are they? If you think about it, none of them are built around a high rate of construction or a high volume of construction. Maybe the trawler yards. But are they really built around that? higher rate of volume of construction and that's a very different shaped yard yes there isn't the need there used to be but there's still a need and that's a problem now if you're a government like britain you could go, well, we have the Archer-class patrol vessels and similar. Perhaps what we need to do to sustain a slightly higher capacity of construction is just keep ordering four of those a year. And when we finish, uh, when we're not using them, if we have too many, sell them or give them away to Caribbean and other countries which might need them. It's a viable option. It's not great. But it's a viable option to try and keep a motor, but it's to try and keep a sort of production capacity. But it's something we have to think about. We do have to think about, which we didn't used to have to. Now, 
I have talked a bit about them in the past before, but I thought, well, I've mentioned mine-laying submarines quite a bit. So the class which the Germans tended to use for the inshore work, because there was an entire battle going on, and again, this would be probably a subject of a cool book, is the type you see to mine-laying submarines. And they're some of the most successful for the Germans in World War One. 64 were built and 46 were lost. So they're successful, but they lose two-thirds of their numbers. Displacements, roughly 400 to 434 tons, and their complement is roughly 26, including three officers. They only have a periscope as their sensor. Armaments are very limited, but let's be honest, the critical one is the 18 mines deployed through six internal chutes. 18 mines popping up where you didn't know they would be. Or maybe six mines dropped off in one place. And then six mines in another, and six in another. It's ambush predator. Again, it's something worth thinking about because if we consider how much fewer our submarines are these days, remote weapons, mines, or some version of them, might well become one of their most useful systems if they were fitted with them. Because it allows them to create little patches of oceans which ambush other people. And they don't have to be there. There's no risk, no exposure to them. They can be off doing another job. They can be off launching cruise missiles or something. They could even rig a trap where they put some mines in a position between them and the nearest enemy patrol where they think they're most likely to be, launch their cruise missiles, and watch the enemy ship try and charge through that area of the minefield to get to them. Who knows? But it's worthwhile thinking that in both world wars, often the most successful weapon for submarines has not been the torpedo. And Goodness knows we don't go to, want to go back to the deck gun day. But was the mine. So, what have we got come out? Well, we have, of course, naval fire support coming out today. But we have armoured cruisers introduction on, the thir on Thursday. And we have various one or two books to review coming out. And we have Patreon 31 on on Thursday, when I'll also be announcing the vote for the September patrons, I think. I think that's what I've got to announce. I think that's what the suggestion is, right? If the suggestion isn't live, the suggestions will be going up and the vote will be announced the following week. Anyway. Take care, everyone. One last thing before I go. So, there have already been some complaints that the Blackburn Blackburn has got its own stuff, has got a lovely cup, mug, t-shirt, hoodie, all these things. And the Church of the Cataclysmic Kathleen, as I like to call it, hasn't. So, here is what I'm going to say. If you want this, to be submitted to Spreadshirt. I will do so. I have checked. That's a 1939 image. I'm allowed to use it of the RAF. I'm allowed to use it. If you want it, and if you would like it as an option, comment below. It will both tell me how many of you watched the full length of the video. <laughs> That's an evil one on mine. But also, it will tell me if there's actual uh, is an actual demand or it's just people whinging. Because I have to admit, this is sound terrible. But I thought with the Blackburn Blackburn, it was people winding me up. And now I've sold like thirty T-shirts. You're you're worrying me here, people. So rather than just presume that, I have got the cataclysmic cataclysmic Calistina done. If you'd like it, put it below and tell me. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care.